Uh, the accuracy in academia was this organization of right-wing people who were always trying to. But I don't know if it even exists now, does it? They, they moved to accuracy in the media or something. But anyway, they were trying to they were trying to get left-wing people out of academia, trying to harass them and everything. And they they put out this little publication. And they said, uh, and they had an article on Dick, and it said, uh, uh, Marxism among the Mormons. <laughs> that, was the, that was the headline for the article they did on Dick. And, uh, I imagine you still have a copy of that, huh, Dick? Yeah, I do. Yeah. They called me the Pipe Piper of Marx. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, those are, those are fun days. Yeah. That, that was. Uh, when we were over in the business building, Dean was the undergraduate uh, uh, advisor. Yeah, yeah. Hey Pete, will you pass the cookies around since everybody sat down before they arrived? Like, just put them on the table and pass them around? Oh. <laughs> just in case anybody wants one that doesn't know they're there. Thanks. Can I take one? <laughs> hey, just grab one for me. I have the tape running, Kay, in case you have any other people you'd like to embarrass. <laughs> well, no, that doesn't embarrass Kay. He's, that's one of his points of pride in his career. It's how I got fact, my job at Westminster. Yes, in fact, uh, it didn't. In fact, the, my biggest disappointment in Dick, he's such a marvelous teacher, one of the best teachers we've ever put out here at the University of Utah, is that unfortunately he's going into administration now, aren't you, Dick? He's going to become dean. I just hate to see that because he's such a gifted teacher. <laughs> that changes everything, Kay. Yeah, I said yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good. Good. I, uh, I mean, I don't begrudge you the extra salary, but, but I wish you didn't have to not teach so much because he was always a, a really gifted teacher. And we've had a lot of superb teachers come through this program, a lot of superb scholars too. I think uh, uh, amazingly good, I think. I've followed a lot of them that I've known over the years. Uh, the fellow who I got to make the third edition. I didn't feel like revising this again. So I got Mark Latzenheiser. I don't know if any of you know Mark, but uh, he was a PhD student here at the University of Utah and is now a professor. I forget that college he's at. Uh, Earl. In Earl. Earl, thank you, in Indiana. And uh, he was a superb student, too. Uh, we've had some people that uh, just are as good as you can find anywhere on earth uh, in any school. And he was one we've had a lot. I just got back from uh, going up to Willamette University and visiting uh, Jerry Gray up there, who was one of Dick's best friends back when he was a student here at Utah. He was a superb uh, student as well. So we've had. Oh, I mean, I can't start ticking them off. <laughs> For sure, miss a lot of them that were really, really good. And so, it, so I'm really happy and proud to be in that same tradition myself because, of course, I was a student here. I was in the early 60s. I started out in, uh, I got a bachelor's degree in economics, but I was very interested in philosophy. So I started out a graduate student in philosophy. Ironically, this is where the philosophy department was. <laughs> when I was a graduate student in philosophy, it was right here. And this was a part of their department uh, right then. And um, all they had was a master's degree with regular classes. And if you wanted to get a PhD, you had to do it with uh, directed readings and special studies and things of this sort. And that's what I was going to do, but I was 
running short of money, but I liked some things in economics because I was always very interested in uh, uh, matters of wealth and poverty and justice and injustice and so forth. And matters of justice and injustice are at their very heart involved in economics, in my opinion. So I was always interested in economics. And, and at a personal level in economics, the philosophy department didn't have at that time any TAs, and the <laughs> economics department did. So in the 62-63 school year, I became a TA in economics, even though I was still thinking I would get a PhD in philosophy. But I would, it would pay my tuition and give me a stipend. And that year, I graded and served as a, a person in sections of principles. And then in the fall of 63, I taught my first class. So this fall will be my 50th anniversary from teaching my first class uh, 50 years ago. I taught what was then Economics 1, which later became 105, and we don't have a class like that now. It was a generalized class for non-majors. It was much funner to teach the principles. <laughs> <laughs> much funner, better class uh, to teach. Uh, I talked to Jean. I'm very flattered that you asked me to come back. I, I miss being a teacher. I miss it a lot. There are things that I enjoy about being retired, but there are things that I miss very much about uh, interacting with students. That it, 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 it has been the most rewarding profession that I can even imagine. The people that I mentioned and innumerable others that I haven't mentioned, it's been such a rewarding thing to interact with them and to have many of them. I'm friends with to this day, decades after some of them. But in fact, some of the students that I'm very close friends with are retired professors now <laughs> that I served on their PhD and dissertation committees and some of them have retired. Uh, in fact, a couple that uh, Kirsten got to go in that little book that you made on a couple of those have retired now from being professors. Uh, I mentioned to Jean, I just talked about history of economic thought because I think that's really a crucial thing to study for economics. Not just because I think it's more interesting than most economics classes, which I do think that, but uh, there's, there are important other reasons why I think it's the most important thing to study. On the flyleaf of my History of Economic Thought book, I have uh, two quotations that I like, one from Keynes and one from Marx, and uh, they both are very important to me. They both illustrate something that is important to me. Keynes said, a study of the history of opinion, that's what he called it, a study of the history of opinion is a necessary preliminary to the emancipation of the mind. That's a pretty powerful statement a necessary preliminary to the emancipation of the mind. Marx's statement is an even more powerful one, I think, and it certainly is powerful to me. It really touches something deep in me, Marx's statement. He says, quote, ideas won by our intelligence, embodied in our outlook, and forged in our conscience are chains from which we cannot tear, our, tear ourselves away without breaking our hearts. They are demons we can overcome only by submitting to them. <laughs> and of all the things he wrote, nothing is truer than that, in my opinion. When I first came to the University of Utah and became chair of the department here, a lot of people were somewhat startled. In fact, the people in the College of Business got some of their friends. They used to have business advisors to the College of Business. I don't know if they have that anymore. But they had an advisory board, business advisory board of businessmen. And their businessmen had a lot of ties to the Board of Regents. And you know, to be appointed chair of any department, the Board of Regents has to uh, approve your appointment as chair. 
the College of Business got their advisors to go to the Board of Regents and say, veto this guy, he's a communist. That's what they said. Actually, the truth of the matter is, and I, and I hate to say I am not now, nor have I ever been, <laughs> but uh, the truth of the matter is, if I had wanted to join, I wouldn't know where you sign up. <laughs> I wouldn't have known where. But they said, this, this guy is a communist. And uh, that got back to the president of the university we had at that time. We had, in succession, one of the best presidents I can imagine, and then one of the worst. I'm not going to mention the name of one of the worst, but I am going to mention one of the best, and I'm going to have to ask my darling wife, Jody, to remind me, because I'm getting so old that names slip my mind right now. David Gardner. David Gardner, thank you. David Gardner was, a, was uh, David Gardner was one of the best university presidents. In fact, he went from here to being president of the University of California system, and he was a wonderful president. And he heard that Board of Regents was going to veto me being chair as I was supposedly a communist, that's what they said. So he called Herb Altman, psychology professor who was dean of social sciences at that time, and he said, how about this guy? Is he some bomb-throwing communist or something like that? And Herb Altman said, no, he's a scholar. He'd be a good chair to be chair of the department. So Irv had me come over and talk to me for quite a while. And we went over and talked to the president, because the president wanted to be confident that I wasn't some scary person <laughs> or anything. And uh, <coughs> so after he talked to me, the president went to the meeting of the Board of Regents, where my name was coming up to be chair. And he said, I've heard a nasty rumor to the fact that you're going to veto uh, Professor E.K. Hunt as chair of the Department of Economics. He said, if you do, please accept my resignation. <laughs> now that is, in my opinion, a superb president. You could not ask for a president more committed to academic freedom than that. No wonder he got a job like being president of the whole University of California system. What a good guy he was. We unfortunately were followed by a president that was at the other end of the <laughs> spectrum, I will even mention him. Uh, anyway, uh, the, when I studied philosophy, however, I became somewhat disillusioned with philosophy because why had I got, oh, I want to, I, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I have a kind of a sequence. I don't know that there's anyone in here other than Kirsten, who's taken a class from me. Is there anyone in here who's taken Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Has, they, those of you who've taken a class from me know that I have in mind a trajectory, but I don't follow it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I, I'll try to go back and get to my trajectory. Um, when I first became chair, the Tribune sent the guy to do a story. They did a pretty big story on me. It was actually a page and a half in the Tribune. Um, and, they, and so they, had this, they said, how did a Mormon boy from a little town like Blanding become a nationally known socialist economist? How did that ever happen? From this, not only a little town like Blanding, but a little town like Blanding where everybody is a Mormon. Actually, there was one non-Mormon family in Blanding, when I grew up in Blanding. And we all used to walk out of our way going home from school to see if they looked funny. <laughs> They're non-Mormons, so they might look funny. <laughs> so we'd walk around right to see them. And, uh, and, and I, t I told them, uh, that's, that's not so strange. The odds of that happening are probably just about the same as if I'd grown up in New York City, but New York City has nine or 10 million people, and if you take the odds of that, and if you take Blanding that only had 900 people, probably the odds aren't that, the probability's not that different, but the main thing that I said is that uh, 
I didn't really renounce or, or get angry at my Mormon or Christian upbringing. I just took certain parts of it much more seriously than most of my peers. For example, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor, blessed are, are the weak. And, and uh, statements like, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And uh, statements like that. Moreover, my great-grandfather had been involved in the establishment of the early Mormon cooperatives that had been, had been aiming at creating socialism. So uh, you have a lot of possibilities in your background to be attracted to socialism in the first place. So I said, it wasn't that I got, gave up anything. I just, uh, like many 18-year-old kids when I started college, I was curious. See, like all kids at 18, you're told what to think mostly up to then doesn't matter if you're Mormon or Catholic or atheist or anything else. Mostly when you're 18, people have told you what the world is, what you think about it and everything. And people have told you. And you've taken almost everything on the authority of people that have told you that. When you're 18, some of us, some people never change from that. They continue to take it on authority the rest of their life. But some of us, and I was one in this latter category, start thinking, well, I wonder, a lot of people think differently than I do. And they've been taking it on authority, and I've been taking it on authority. I better look into this and see what I really think and what I really believe. And that's, now at first, when I started college, I got shunted into mathematics, because that was my highest score. On, some students who had me for a class will be shocked to hear that because I avoided math in economics. <laughs> but uh, that was my highest score on, on everything in, in, in high school and when I got into college and I was a math major for a couple of years. But then that seemed so sterile and so uninvolved with the things that really interested me in the world. So then I got into philosophy and economics. And then in graduate school, I started thinking I'd get a PhD in philosophy. But it soon became clear to me that the only thing I liked in philosophy were the history of philosophy courses. Because the Greek philosophers and the medieval philosophers got into things that really interested me. Things about the individual and what does life mean and what reason is there to believe in God. What reason is there to believe in life after death? What reason is there to think uh, there is real, ultimate metaphysical freedom and not freedom and so forth? And the 20th century philosophers were getting into the realms of very esoteric high logic. Ludwig Wittgenstein was the... Uh, patron saint of a lot of 20th century philosopher that was getting into very esoteric uh, stuff and philosophy that, so far as I could see, had no, sh it did not shine any light on any issues that I wanted to study. So at some point, I decided to get out of philosophy, although I did take a PhD qualifying exam in philosophy and I passed it happy to say. Uh, I then shifted completely to economics, thinking that's where I'm going to get into these questions of the individual, the relation of the individual to the social whole and to ethical and, and uh, ethical questions of justice and social justice and so forth. And then I soon learned that while this might seem the case at the beginning and intermediate level sometimes of economics, at a higher level, it became an exercise in esoteria, not dissimilar to philosophy. And uh, it seemed like I was going in the same old direction again. But at that point, I had a wife and a child. I needed to get a job. So I wrote a dissertation and 
became a professor of philosophy, but I want to talk to you about why it's good to study the history of philosophy. I want to especially, uh, because as you know, I think many of you have taken, uh, uh, I said history of philosophy, I mean, history of ideas generally, history of economics for people in economics. As you know, if you've studied it, there are very different approaches to economics and very different economic theories you study in the history of economics and very different conclusions. Very different. Very different attitudes about what's good for society, what's good for people, and what. And so I'm not going to go through a lot of them. I'm just going to say it came to me that most of these theories, where they're going to end up in terms of the moral conclusions, the ideological conclusions, the policy conclusions, are implicit in the premises they start with. That's what came to me. It seems to me that way to this day. It seems that the premises have implicitly the conclusions that are going to come out of most of these theories. And it's not an accident that most of the people start from the point of view because they want to get to those conclusions. Now, I, I believe that there are exceptions to that in the history of economic thought. The ones that I discuss in my book, the two major exceptions that I'd say that is not true of, I would say, are Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. I don't think that's true of them, but I think it's true of most of the rest of the people that I discuss in this book. Now, in particular, what I want to discuss in this book is uh, chapter 14, which is the chapter on welfare economics. And this is why I want you, to, where I want you to, where I want to illustrate why I think it's so important to study the history of economic thought. I want to look at welfare economics. The second subheading of my chapter on welfare economics. This is sort of smart ass whatever a flair on my part. I probably would be more conservative if I was rewriting this book today. <laughs> but here's what I entitled the, the second section of this of this chapter I entitled The Beatific Vision and Eternal Felicity. <laughs> Those are two sections of a famous book by St. Augustine, the chief systematizer of Catholic philosophy in early medieval Catholicism that laid out Catholic theology as the, in his famous book, The City of God. And the City of God is basically the medieval social order and everything about medieval social order was justified and made the will of God by St. Augustine and the Catholic Church. And the church and the priests and the bishops and the cardinals and the pope all became apologists for the social order of medieval Europe. And so I entitled this second section, The Beatific Vision, The Wonderful Happiness Vision, an eternal felicity, happiness. Uh, in microeconomic theory, in the famous uh, Francis Baytor article on the simple analytics of welfare and maximization, 1957, well over a half century now, but so far as I know, it has changed very drastically in that half century. He, you finally end up at what he calls the bliss point. That's what he calls it, the bliss point. My fellow graduate students and I, back in the early 1960s, called that the cosmic orgasm. <laughs> Everyone in the cosmos is having an orgasm simultaneously. <laughs> it's the bliss point. Uh, uh, now, um, what you'll notice when you go through uh, an ordinary intermediate microeconomics textbook, you'll come near the end of the textbook to a section on welfare economics. And then you'll come to a section on 
production theory and, uh, and Isaac wants and uh, the return to the factors of production and all that sort of thing where you and then you'll come to a thing on consumption and uh, uh, but what you'll notice is that every single point leading up to the bliss point every single point you study in that chapter there's a reason why it's near the end of the intermediate microeconomic theory textbook maybe some textbooks different now because I haven't looked at an intermediate textbook for many years. But when I was writing this, I looked at every one I could uh, find, but it's been quite a few years since I wrote this. But every one at that point, I couldn't find one that was any different. Every single argument to reach the bliss point of happiness and efficiency and market efficiency had been made earlier as a, as a standard point of microeconomic analysis every single point there was no new argument in welfare economics that did not that was not made in an earlier point in the microeconomic theory now what i do in that chapter is to show you what a weak footing it's on how many how now there's nothing that i do in what i would view as savagely tearing apart neoclassical welfare economics. Nothing that I do that's original with me. Not a thing. I didn't come up with one critique of neoclassical welfare economics that's original with me. I just went through the literature. It has been ripped to shreds in the literature. Everything about it has been ripped to shreds. Has it been abandoned? This is what's really crucial, it seems to me. Has it been abandoned? Beyond the intermediate theory level, my answer is yes. What I found out in the profession, many times talking to many high-powered conservative neoclassical economists, is if you start saying, here's the problem with neoclassical welfare economics. Yeah, yeah, so what? So what? So what? So what? Why is it in the textbook? Well, that's low level. That's a heuristic uh, little model that doesn't mean anything. What we're getting into here, let's say, is uh, we're getting into some kind of uh, very esoteric model of complex bargaining with different agencies under different conditions of, of uh, risk and uncertainty with uh, different degrees of uh, connection and unconnection. And, it's very, very esoteric, but it's not anything like this uh, uh, welfare economics. And you get into other models like that that no longer, they no longer even defend that. Well, why do you teach it then to every single student? Now, I'm, I'm talking to my friend Jerry Gray, who's a graduate of this department, has a PhD from this department, and he's up in Willamette University and what he's trying to do out there is they're trying, they've got a very uh, liberal leaning department there and they're trying to alter the undergraduate program somewhat so they have a, a alternative approaches to economics get a little more uh, weight and they're having a really hard time because that entrenchment of neoclassical economics that you get in beginning principles microeconomics, intermediate macro, microeconomics, and in welfare economics here is so entrenched as a standard that if they don't give it to their students, they're running the risk if their students want to go to another school of saying the students from Willamette University are incompetent because they did not memorize the Holy Grail. They did not memorize the things that uh, are holy, the scriptures for our order. That's why I call that uh, that's, well, that's why I think of economics as a modern day Catholic church. Academic economics is what in medieval life the Catholic Church was. 
There is some differences. They're not exactly the same. In medieval life, I would have been burned at the stake. I'm so happy that they're not exactly the same. <laughs> you see, what I would be would have been a rogue priest. I would have been a priest who got the teachings but went down the wrong path. And I probably would have been, if not burned at the stake, tarred and feathered and run out of, of town. See, but uh, there is a reason because market efficiency, the notion of market efficiency, the no notion of automaticity, the notion that if you balance the budget, you'll get out of this recession that you're in, that market automaticity, that the market will do things efficiently. There's no other argument for that except the argument implicit in welfare economics. That's where the market efficiency argument comes from with all of its weaknesses, which it's riddled with weaknesses. But there aren't other arguments. Joseph Stiglitz called it a pretty silly faith, but we've all got that faith. But there's no good intellectual reason to have it. It's just a pure faith. That's someone who won the Nobel Prize. Only Nobel Prize winner that I've ever personally talked to, ever, is once I went to this uh, week-long symposium that I was lucky to get invited to. The reason I was, well, I was lucky for a few reasons, but one of the reasons is that I stayed at a downtown hotel 